Hello and welcome to this video on Kathleen Jennings' Flyaway. The novella Flyaway is a kind of gothic fairy tale, following young Bettina Scott and her former friends Gary Damson and Trish Aberdeen as she figures out the secrets surrounding her family and the disappearance of her father and brothers. Presented at first as a kind of liberation tale from her overly controlling, prim and proper mother Nerida, and her almost overly obvious brainwashing and manipulation of Bettina, more and more layers emerge as the narrative continues, revealing the initial simplicity as mere covers for Flyaway's subtle complexity. The tale is set in a small western Queensland town and, as the inside cover of the novel's first edition tells us, proves that gothic delights and uncanny family horror can live and even thrive under a burning sun, the sun of Australia. European fairy tales abound in Flyaway, starting with the novel's most obvious inspiration by The Seven Ravens, or Die Sieben Raben, found in the famous fairy tale collection of the Brothers Grimm. In the version told by the Grimms, a long yearned for girl is born into a family of seven sons. Since she is frail at birth, the brothers are sent to get water from the well so that she may receive baptism. When they fail to return quickly, the father, in a moment of anger, wishes they'd be turned into ravens, which promptly happens. Years later, it is up to the young girl to travel the world in order to free her brothers from the curse. In Jennings' version, there are only two brothers, but they too have been cursed. In Flyaway, though, they are cursed to remain human until their sister frees them and helps them transform into birds. While the narrative in Flyaway uses some well-known tropes, including that of the evil stepmother, it also subverts fairy tale tropes in a number of ways, not least by having the mother abuse her biological daughter as well, and by portraying the human form as the curse, not the animal shapes, which, on the contrary, provide escape and freedom. Even the evil mother figure is eventually revealed to be more nuanced, as her flight into hyperfemininity is a result of the gendered violence she endured when her human husband turned her from flowers into a flower wife for him. However, The Seven Ravens is by no means the only fairy tale that is rewritten and adapted to the Australian setting in Flyaway, which reflects Jennings' fascination with the beauty and horror of fairy tales. This rather telling choice of words, taken from a feature on Jennings and her creations on the University of Queensland website, also indicates another core element of Flyaway, namely its Gothic and particularly Australian Gothic undertones, though the focus of this lecture will be on the various fairy tales contained in the novel. Before we delve further into the Gothic fairy tale that is Flyaway, it is necessary to talk about fairy tales in general. Fairy tales as themes or inspirations crop up frequently in speculative fiction, and so it is useful to have some academic tools at your disposal to talk about them, even beyond the frame of this video. For a definition, I turn to the acclaimed fairy tale scholar Marina Warner in her very short introduction to the fairy tale. According to Warner, the fairy tale belongs in the general realm of folklore, and many fairy tales are called folk tales, attributed to oral tradition and considered anonymous and popular in the sense of originating not among an elite, but among the unlettered, the folk, the people in German. The accumulated wisdom of the past has been deposited in them, at least that is the feeling a fairy tale radiates and the claim the form has made since the first collections. Scholars of fairy tales distinguish between genuine folk tales, Märchen, and literary or art fairy tales, Kunstmärchen. The first are customarily anonymous and undateable, the latter signed and dated, but the history of the story's transmission shows inextricable and fruitful entanglement. Clearly, if we look at Flyaway as a fairy tale, it has to be a Kunstmärchen, seeing as it was written fairly recently by an accurately identifiable author, Kathleen Jennings. However, the narrative is infused with references to the genuine folk tales Warner is referring to, 
So as an aside, it has to be said that the notion of genuine is not entirely uncomplicated either, seeing as multiple fairy tales also fall in between categories. Before we move on, let's zero in on the idea of categories. Andrew Taverson, in his new Critical Idiom volume on the fairy tale, provides a handy visual representation of a variety of folk narratives and their possible interrelations. At the top of his chart is the umbrella term folk narrative, which branches out into myth, legend and the folk tale. From the folk tale, Teverson draws a line to animal tales, jokes and anecdotes, formula tales and finally the so-called ordinary folk tale, which is a category he further diversifies into religious tales, the novella, tales of the stupid ogre, and, of course, the fairy tale proper, which he also calls tales of magic. These categorizations are not necessarily undebated. The animal tale, for example, could well fit into the category of fairy tale if we consider such prominent examples as Puss in Boots, the town musicians of Bremen, and indeed the Seven Ravens. Other distinctions are much clearer, since we are unlikely to mistake a religious tale, such as a saint legend, for a fairy tale. But again, the tale of the stupid ogre may well be considered a fairy tale by some, as is also indicated by the Shrek children's movies, which clearly position the ogre within the context of fairy tales in general. Teverson claims that in fairy tales, the magical, in the form of metamorphic transformations, loquacious animals, enchanting spells and improbable feats, is a necessary and ubiquitous precondition. Furthermore, the magic needs to be accepted in order for a story to qualify as a fairy tale. Magic is normative in fairyland, and the ordinary rules are suspended. The cat just talks. For those of you who have already watched my lecture on fantasy as a whole, the term fairy tale or fairy story will already have come up in the context of J.R.R. Tolkien's essay on fairy stories. And Tolkien takes fairy to refer to the land of fairy, though this is not a geographical unit either. It is the type of accepted magic Teverson also includes in his definition of fairy tales. Unlike Tolkien, Teverson also handily provides a more detailed description of the air that blows in that country, or to put it more prosaically than Tolkien, the basic plot of the fairy tale. A fairy tale typically deals with the experiences of a youthful protagonist engaged on a journey or in a series of tasks and trials that has been necessitated by a change in his or her status, the death of a parent or the loss of a magical object. This journey or series of tasks take place in an imaginative environment peopled by strange beings and wonderful creatures, some of which prove helpful and some of which become hazardous threats. Almost invariably, the progress of the hero is hindered by the actions of a dangerous opponent, such as a witch, an ogre, a wolf, a tyrant king, or a malignant stepmother. But equally invariably, that is to say almost but not quite, the hero or heroine overcomes his or her opponent, completes the journey or the set of tasks, and, in so doing, secures for himself or herself a more comfortable life and a more socially eminent position than seemed possible at the start of the story. For now, this should be enough on fairy tale theory to help us in analysing Flyaway, as it helps us not only see how well the novel lines up with some of the key features of fairy tales, but it also enables us to better evaluate the cultural importance of fairy tales as a medium of oral transmission of both cautionary tales and local lore. Translating them into an Australian context, as Jennings does, serves to grapple with a landscape that is initially foreign to the tellers of European fairy tales in Australia. Flyaway is set in a small western Queensland town, as the blurb tells us, and thus ostensibly takes place outside of fairy. But the novel begins in a very fairy tale like manner. All that was is the title of a prologue that begins thus. Once, somewhere between the Coral Sea and the Indian Ocean, but on the way to nowhere, 
there was a district called, oh, let's call it Inglewell. The next three pages paint a vivid picture of Flyaway's fairy tale setting, albeit by now overlaid by the smooth, sturdy engineering of the mining companies. The community is practically overrun with European fairy tale symbology. We have three villages, 13 streets in the main village, three churches, all surrounded by trees, but not all is as it seems. The clawing precision of hard-won roses planted in wire-fenced gardens on the buried corpses of roadside kangaroos. This sentence indicates that the European fairy tale and its landscape were imposed, perhaps violently, on the original landscape of Australia. Every fairy tale element seems to be derived from European folklore rather than an Australian fairy or folktale tradition, but then adapted to the new setting. A prominent example of this, already featured in the first pages of the book, is the trees surrounding the community of Inglewell. The forest has been a staple feature of fairy tales precisely because of its groundedness in European history and its ubiquitous threats to early European storytellers. Here it consists of trees like lanterns, like candles, ghosts and bones. The fibrous skeletons of mother-slain cactus and beetle-eaten lantern bush leaned over the opal-veined bulk of petrified limbs spilled in empty creek beds. Trees bled resin like rubies, sprouted goitrous nests, suspended cat's cradles of spider webs, spinning discs of silk. Trees towered hard as bronze in still sunlight and stirred like a living hide in the rolling advent of a storm. It is a landscape that is distinctive to both a mythical land of fairy tales and Australia, seeing as it incorporates a western Queensland landscape familiar to Jennings, as well as the telltale rural isolation that we find in many Australian writings, especially those in the Gothic mode. Within the setting of an Australianized fairy tale enchanted forest, the narrative follows Bettina Scott on her quest to find out what truly happened to her father and brothers, who are said to have left behind Bettina and her mother. Bettina's surroundings represent European notions of being quote-unquote civilized and proper. Her mother is obsessed with the need to be decent, tiny and ornamental, which seems to coincide with the need to be as distanced as possible from the surrounding Australian landscape, best mirrored by the Scots Garden, which contained nothing native to the ground from which we daily coaxed and tortured it. This also functions as a symbol for mastery over nature and the binary dichotomy of civilization versus wilderness that Bettina's mother wishes to uphold by exerting force upon both Garden and her entire family. Ultimately, such binary opposition is, of course, doomed to fail, and perhaps doubly so because the so-called alleged civilization is forcibly imposed upon Australia. Nerida Scott's behaviour can be read as abusive towards both environment and family, enhanced by magical mastery over language, which allows her to shape and influence most people around her. Interestingly, while both behaviours are characterised as unnatural and damaging, it seems that the initial problem is not necessarily caused by a real binary opposition between a civilised narrator, whatever that might mean, and an uncivilised Australia, but rather by Nerida's nature as a flower and a flower woman being introduced into an environment where she simply does not seem to belong. Eventually, it is necessary for Bettina to free herself from her mother's influence in order to search for her brothers Mitch and Chris, and to solve the mystery of her father's disappearance. The connections to the fairy tale The Seven Ravens, which provides some elements of the plot, are not always overt, but the notion that the brothers have transformed into birds, for example, is present right from the beginning, when Bettina associates them with being crow horse with laughter and lanky as cranes. Bird imagery permeates fly away, with the hair of the Scott brothers being described as feathered, bird skulls being used as protective charms, 
structures of wings nailed to boards, and a creature described as tangled like an albatross in rigging. This perhaps invites readers to expect the brothers to have been turned into birds, as in the fairy tale. However, Mitch and Chris are eventually revealed to have been more or less created as human sons for their father Daryl Scott, when actually they should have been birds. They were then condemned to a monstrous human existence by Nerida Scott, who could not abide their wild nature. Bettina uses the persuasive magic inherited from her mother to free her brothers by simply instructing them to be birds. Nerida's controlling behavior and manipulation is also recontextualized, not to be excused, but to be explained as a perhaps understandable reaction to the violence done to her by Daryl Scott. Scott, after all, plucked her from her existence as a flower against her will, a kind of kidnapping, thus making her into a flower wife which explains not only her insistence on stereotypical femininity, but also her overwhelming need to be in control of a domestic, orderly setting without much noise or upheaval. It could, perhaps, even be read as a response to trauma. Interestingly, Nerida's need for well-ordered, modest domesticity as well as her floral nature also mirror the artificial fairy tales written at the fin de siècle and the beginning of the 20th century, with the aim of providing a kind of mythological background to the white settlers in Australia. In drawing this connection, one might also read Jennings' Fly Away as an attempt to problematize such introduced fairy tales, while also showing how they do adapt to the Australian landscape and can be useful as well as potentially damaging and invasive. The story of Little Red Riding Hood is the first of several stories within a story, each recounting the experiences of one of the side characters, both minor and major. In it, Linda Aberdeen, the mother of Tina's former friend Trish, is, of course, trying to visit her grandmother in a remote location. On the way into the woods, she spots a strange animal that has the peculiar grey blonde of the grass, like ash and honey. Its limbs were thin, its skull narrow, and its eyes glass green, brilliant and alive. With small ears, the whole flanked body tapering into a skeletal tail. It is never made explicit textually, but the initial illustration that precedes the story, taken together with the descriptions, allow for it to be identified as the extinct thylacine or Tasmanian tiger. Little Red Riding Hood's wolf not only becomes distinctly Australian, but also supernatural in several ways, as it seems to have been resurrected from the dead. Additionally, the thylacine is also a were-creature, the transformed David Spicer, Sylvie Spicer's son. Davy Spicer disappeared at the exact moment when Linda's mother emerged from the woods and convinced Sylvie Spicer to let her stay, thus ultimately leading to Linda believing that Sylvie was her actual grandmother. It is plausible to interpret Linda's mother as the previous were thylacine, who has now switched shapes with David, condemning him to a life as a thylacine in her stead. As Linda encounters her mother's victim, he turns human again in her embrace, while Linda turns into the thylacine. Linda, as the Australian Little Red Riding Hood, has been devoured by the beast at least metaphorically, and in this tale it was the grandmother figure who drove her into the thylacine's path, thus making the original grandmother more threatening and a co-conspirator instead of a hapless victim. Linda may, however, yet be freed from her fate as her daughter Trish is sent on a trail by a mysterious human hand with a wedding ring found in a dingo trap, and the advice given by Grandmother Damson whose family seeks to keep the European fairy tales encroaching upon Australian settings in check. Outside forces encroaching upon an Australian setting also play an important role in yet another fairy tale retelling, that of the Pied Piper, in which an invasive plant species, from Asia, not Europe, takes on the role of the rats. The Pied Piper motive comes to the fore 
when the three young adults at the center of Flyaway, Gary, Trish, and Tina, investigate the now abandoned town of Woodwild. Instead of a plague of rats, it is a plague of lantern bush, a plant introduced from outside of Australia that torments the town to the point where politicians offered rewards to anyone who could kill the stuff. In fairy tale like manner, the story continues, and that winter, he arrived. He is the Pied Piper figure, and is described suitably enigmatically. He had pale hair, he himself was so pale he almost glowed, as if he spent all his time inside. Beautiful. More than a metaphorical Piper figure, the newly arrived Daryl, potentially Bettina's father, is a Piper, albeit a bagpiper, in possession of a rather uncanny set of bagpipes. He seemingly gets rid of the lantern bush plague by playing his pipes to the plants, making them shrivel. However, his intervention just happens to coincide with the government's more scientific approach of introducing yet another invasive species of beetles to devour the lantern bush, which is then used to cheat the piper out of his monetary reward, as science, of course, was expected not to care about thousand-dollar rewards. As in the German fairy tale originating in the city of Hamelin, the piper responds by using his powers in order to take away the town's children, in this case encasing them, sleeping beauty-like, in a hedge of lantern bush that devours their school with the children still inside. Now, even though Australia is a world away from German fairy tale mysteries, historically, geographically and culturally, as Masson states, the inclusion of the Pied Piper in Flyaway is part of greater Australian literary tradition. Masson argues that major motifs from the Pied Piper appear in several Australian novels, transformed not only by distance of setting and time from that of the original narrative, but also by elements specific to the Australian imaginative space. These motifs are lost children, the enigmatic figure of the piper himself, and the power of a very particular space. Certainly these motives are all present in Flyaway, and the notion of people disappearing is reiterated throughout the novel as well as subtly brought into connection with the supernatural and fairy tale like. As the novel reads, then there were stories of those who had simply gone walked into the trees or vanished from a tent in the night, been swallowed up in long-fingered leaves, waded into water holes, or fallen through cracks in the earth. The figure of the piper in particular, who is most likely Bettina's father, aids the main narrative in that it foreshadows Daryl Scott's darker side and his potentially abusive actions towards his wife and sons, that is, creating them as human against their will. Additionally, the Pied Piper story is one of the main tales used by Jennings to destabilize interpretations as to whether the fairy tale like events in the district of Inglewell are actually happening or not. There is a rational explanation for the disappearance of Woodwild's children, a fire at the school, and the original story of the Pied Piper of Hamelin seems to have at least some basis in history as hinted at by the ominous entry in the actual town record of Hamelin of 1384, which reads, Es ist hundert Jahre her, seit unsere Kinder weggingen, or It is a hundred years since our children left. This ominous sentence obviously has led to much speculation as to what actually happened in Hamelin to have inspired the Pied Piper story. We have now looked at a variety of European fairy tales which make their Australianized appearance in Flyaway. These tales have quite overtly been superimposed on an Australian landscape without much regard for the stories that were already there before European settlers ever set foot on the continent. There is of course ample reason why European writers or writers with European backgrounds choose to import their own stories rather than appropriate indigenous ones especially in more recent times when such cultural appropriation is no longer easily permissible. Earlier attempts by prominent collectors of Aboriginal stories, such as K. Langlo Parker, 
while sometimes providing the names of the original tellers, are rightly criticized in contemporary literary scholarship. However, the European stories themselves occasionally seem somewhat ill-fitting to the foreign continent. And the earliest European-Australian fairy tale writings reflect this by already drawing a connection between European fairy tales and invasive species. Fairies may be transported to Australia from elsewhere, inside a Japanese vase, Strasbourg clock, and Chinese baskets, or they fall asleep in a flower that was then pressed in the pages of a book and carried to Australia. A similar idea is represented not only in Jennings' Flyaway, but also in her short story Undying Love, which has overt intertextual ties to the novella. Both types of invasive species, biological entities as well as stories imported from elsewhere, feature in Flyaway. A story told by Gary Dempson specifically mentions that there wasn't anything bigger than him in the trees that hadn't been brought from England. And the story of the Megarity, which may or may not be fictional, also states that, like many odd creatures, it had been carried idly away from its land, in a sea chest perhaps, or on a shoulder, or tangled like an albatross in rigging, or netted like a woman in rough clothes and bridal vows. The lantern bush that eventually devours Woodwild's children is likewise an invasive species, this time from China, not Europe. The Damsons seem to disapprove of these encroaching stories as well as of the Scots, but they as a family remain mostly inactive, merely enforcing borders and fences of all kinds and keeping a somewhat passive eye on things. In the short story Online Love, the Damson family trait is portrayed both more openly and more actively. Tori Damson, the protagonist of the short story, is not good with people, but a lot better at dealing with introduced species and immigrant creatures, employing various methods such as walking the boundaries and thus strengthening them, or aggressive bagpipe playing, which just is a lovely image. Both in Inglewell and in Tory Damson's district, the fairy tales brought to Australia by settlers and immigrants carry their mythological creatures with them as introduced species, which may become dangerous to the Australian landscape, like for example the lantern bush, and therefore have to be kept in check. However, they also merge with the natural space around them, adapting as they are being retold or in flyaway, re-experienced. In a broader sense, the stories carried by both colonizers and more recent immigrants all change in an attempt to, as the novella itself puts it, try to make sense of a land in lots of ways, especially when they first got their hands on it. And in this case, the entity getting their hands on the land is actually the stories rather than the people. In a way, all fairy tales are like that, in that within them people grapple with everyday troubles through a lens of magic, trying to make sense of them. And fairy tale protagonists are recognizably ordinary working people toiling at ordinary occupations over a long period of history. But this is also where contemporary Australian fairy tales written by non-Aboriginal writers differ, as they cannot refer back to such a long-lasting tradition within the landscape. They are quite literally, an introduced and sometimes even invasive species.